The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I, I've been listening with great interest to today's debate, and it's a real honour to be able to contribute it to, my, to it myself as well. I want to outline what I see as the three principal arguments as to why uh, this motion should pass, as to why our involvement in the bombing mission in particular is important. First of all, I think we have a moral obligation to protect the vulnerable. Secondly, I think maintaining our collective security commitments uh, is critical for our security. And thirdly, bombing Daesh is a necessary part of our anti-radicalization efforts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those three things in the time I have today. So first of all, we have a moral obligation to be part of the bombing mission in order to protect the vulnerable. I spoke about this uh, in some detail in my maiden speech, but I'm going to talk again about, about that briefly before I go on to the other points. What is happening right now in Syria and Iraq, Madam Speaker, uh, is nothing short of genocide. We've used that word on this side of the House, and certainly that hasn't been contested by, by any other, other parties here. And genocide has never been quite so visible, so undeniable. Uh, even the Nazis didn't broadcast their atrocities on television. And when it came to past atrocities, many of us could have said, perhaps, if only we had known, we would have done more. But that cannot be said in this case. We all know what is happening in Syria and Iraq. There's no denying it. Uh, if we haven't watched the videos, then we know they exist, Madam Speaker. Now, I hear what the other members are saying. They're saying that, well, perhaps we should help the vulnerable, but we should do it in a different way. But I have a hard time taking those arguments seriously because they don't seem to respect the urgency of the problem. You can educate people to address potential violence. You can train them to address future violence. But if you want to stop current violence, then you need to fight as well. That doesn't mean that there aren't other things we can do to contribute positively at the same time. The approach we advocate on this side of the House is a multi-pronged approach. We support being involved in education, in a humanitarian response, in training, as well as fighting. But talking only about those more long-term aspects of bringing about peace and stability in the region, to me sounds a lot like fixing the locks once the thief is already inside your house. Stop the violence, protect the innocent, and then by all means do more. But there is an imminent threat, a present campaign of violence and genocide. It will require more than words and social programs to stop it. We need to do something right now. We need to respond right now. We need to protect the innocent. We need to do what we can to stop the violence. We have a moral obligation, Madam Speaker, to protect the vulnerable. Secondly, I want to talk about maintaining our collective security commitments, because I think this is crucial for our own security. Uh, now, the party opposite has talked about how, yes, during the last election, they had committed to withdraw from the fight against the Ash, but surely they can see that things have changed since the Paris attacks. Canada and France are both signatories to the NATO treaty, Article 5 of which makes clear that an attack on one NATO ally is an attack on all. Now, Madam Speaker, short of the formal invocation of Article 5, I believe that it is still critically important that NATO members respond together. And now I'm switching to Mr. Speaker, I gather. Uh, Russia and other powers are already testing the resolve of our NATO alliance. When events like the attack on Paris take place, they and others will be watching to see what we do. So it's essential for global and for our own security that NATO stand together and respond together to an act of war against a member state. A strong, united response from NATO will show our resolve, will deter aggressive behavior from other actors, and will keep our people safe. A non-response will do the opposite. Now, Canada has already been attacked right here in this place by Daesh-inspired terrorists. But what happens if we are attacked again in perhaps a more coordinated fashion? And then we go to our NATO allies and ask them, on the basis of our collective security commitments, to be part of a response. What are they going to say to us? Are they going to say, sure, we'll send some blankets and do some training behind the lines? Mr. Speaker, I hope not. Collective security is important. It is the basis on which we stand. It is how we protect ourselves in an environment where we do not have the capacity to oppose the world's largest aggressive powers alone. In addition to the other reasons already given, participating in this bomber mission is how we show that we take collective security seriously. I've said, Mr. Speaker, that we have a moral obligation to protect the vulnerable. 
that maintaining our collective security commitments is critical for our own security. And finally, I'm going to talk about how bombing Daesh is a necessary part of the anti-radicalization effort. Now, we hear a lot from others in this place about de-radicalization, but strangely, we rarely hear them actually define the radicalization that we face. And if we're going to talk about de-radicalization, we have to have a good understanding of what kind of radicalization we're up against. So let's be clear. Daesh is a deeply ideological organization. They are thuggish, violent, and evil, but we should not infer from these things that they are thoughtless. They are thinking about how to enact a very particular, and most would agree very misguided, version of Islam. Whatever you call them, Daesh is a religious group with particular beliefs that we would do well to understand if we care about de-radicalization. Daesh is trying to recreate an imagined 8th century, century caliphate, a caliphate that applies a particular conception of Islamic law, and necessarily that caliphate has certain very particular requirements for its existence. And Mr. Speaker, to define, a, a caliphate is a particular form of religious organization understood in various different forms of Islamic political thought, as encompassing both religious and political control. Uh, in particular, it is ruled by a caliph, thought of to be the successor, successor of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, many different Muslims look in their history to the idea of a caliphate, and there have been different caliphates with different kinds of legacies, most of them, of course, looking nothing like uh, Daesh, the so-called Islamic State. The last caliphate, the Ottoman Turkish Caliphate, was headquartered in Istanbul. It disappeared in 1924 after it was ended by Kemal Ataturk as he turned Turkey into a secular state. For some Muslims, and many of those who are not Daesh supporters, the existence of the caliphate is theologically very important, and they look to its eventual reestablishment. Mr. Speaker, Daesh represents the most serious attempt to resurrect a caliphate in almost 100 years. The particular school of thought that Daesh belongs to would identify a number of key conditions for a caliphate to exist. First of all, the caliph must be a Muslim adult male Horashi. The member, by Horashi, that that's, it means a member of a particular Arabic tribe to which Muhammad also belonged. Secondly, the caliph must demonstrate good moral character. Now, many would, of course, dispute that the, the current uh, claimed uh, caliphate, al-Baghdadi, meets these conditions, and certainly many Muslim theologians have argued persuasively that his actions are essentially anti-Islamic and immoral. But in the eyes of his followers, he has met these conditions. He certainly is Horashi. And in any event, there's not very much that we can do uh, to convince them that he doesn't fit conditions one and two. But the third, and perhaps the most important requirement for a caliph, is that it, he must have authority. A person who meets conditions one and two but has no army or territory, is still disqualified from being a caliph unless and until they acquire territory. Mr. Speaker, this House needs to understand that Daesh is trying to enact this fantasy. They are not just thugs. They are thugs with a particular religious agenda. So why is all this history important for our motion today? Because the most important thing we can do to counter radicalization is to take away Daesh's territory. Without territory, even in the eyes of their followers, they will cease to be a caliphate. We need to wreck this fantasy. We need to show vulnerable men and women who might be susceptible to the arguments of the radicals that there is indeed no real caliphate to join. We need to do this, and frankly, we need to do this right away. Because the longer the, caliphate, the, the, the supposed caliphate exists, the more persuasive the arguments of its boosters will sound. Daesh is not Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is a parastate organization which hopes at best to pave the way for the emergence of a caliphate. They did not have anything near the ambition of Daesh. But Daesh is seriously and ambitiously evil. They are playing for keeps, and we don't know what hell we are in for if we don't stop this madness now. Mr. Speaker, I have two young children. I want to be able to tell them that we got the job done and we didn't leave this for generations to come. We have a moral obligation to protect the vulnerable. Maintaining our collective security commitments is critical for our own security. And bombing Daesh, defeating and destroying Daesh is the necessary step towards effective anti-radicalization. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Guest and comment on the Honorable Member for Oakville.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his uh, impassioned speech. I wanted to begin, I've heard several recitals of the atrocities that are happening and, and committed by Daesh, and I think I want to say that everyone in this House can agree that the Daesh atrocities are despicable, deplorable, and inhumane by every moral standard, and I know we all believe that uh, passionately in this House. Our government has never been opposed to deploying armed forces into combat when it clearly serves Canada's national interest. In this endeavour, success will require highly trained, well-equipped local forces that are invested in the fight for the long term. Our men and women in uniform have years of combat and training experiences and can have a major impact on ensuring that local Iraqi and Kurd uh, Kurdish forces are well prepared to defeat Daesh once and for all. Why does the Honourable Member not recognize the power and the impact of our forces in this form of deployment? Here, here. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, uh, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, well, the Honourable Member and, and the government are trying to offer us false choices. We, of course, agree that there is an important component of training. But the troops on the ground have said, uh, our Kurdish allies have said, that the firepower we bring to the fight is critically important as well. Now, I, I asked this question of an Honourable uh, Member earlier. Uh, if, if they think that our response in terms of the bomber mission is not effective and instead we should be doing something else, who are they getting that information from? Because our allies on the ground are telling us that not just training, but also firepower to stop the violence that is happening right now is critical, is necessary. I don't dispute that the Honourable Member is aware of what's happening, but he doesn't seem to appreciate its imminence. We, we can't just hope that training will lead to, to a better result in the future. We have to respond effectively right now to protect innocent people whose lives are at risk right now. Thank you. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would just like to uh, ask the member what criteria he would use to judge the success of Canada's mission in the Middle East. I think back to George W. Bush's uh, Mission Accomplished show after the American bombardment of Iraq, uh, which did nothing, but, did nothing to help the people of Iraq, but uh, only served to severely destabilize the region and essentially give birth to ISIS. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, we all, I think, understand in this place that, that it is a, a very complicated region. Uh, and certainly, uh, foreign interventions have failed. Uh, there are plenty of cases where, a, uh, where Western power coming in to help those in need has, in fact, succeeded uh, in bringing about genuine transformation. There are cases where it works and cases where it doesn't. And there are reasons in each individual case that we can talk about. But I think one of the most important things here about, about this particular mission is that we are working and we're working effectively with allies on the ground. Uh, there are, of course, ground troops. There are Kurdish troops and others. We're not just a foreign power trying to do this on our own. We're working with local powers to try and, and, and combat this, this uh, group. We're there, in fact, uh, at the request of the Iraqi government. So uh, that, that's a reality that makes this situation very much different from the situation the member alludes to. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, the government keeps referring to, and Liberal members keep referring to, the need <clears throat> to have an enhanced training mission. But training... Um, Coalition partners and allies in general in the Middle East and beyond have not had a good record on training. In fact, uh, in testimony in front of the U.S. Armed Services Committee in September of this year, uh, it was revealed that the United States had spent $500 million on training and trained a total of four or five uh, fighters in northern Syria. Um, and so in Afghanistan as well, training has not uh, borne the result that coalition partners had hoped. And so the real solution here is to maintain our combat mission against the Islamic State. And if members opposite want proof that that is working, they just have to talk to the refugees, the Yazidis that were saved on Mount Sinjar when they were being pursued. You'd have to talk to the Iraqis in Kurdistan and Iraqi Kurdistan about how coalition air power, firepower prevented uh, the Islamic State from attacking them. You just have to talk to the people who were liberated from the siege of Kobani about whether or not air power, combat air power, makes a difference. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan. 
Well, I, I thank the member for, for some very good points. I, I just come back to the point that uh, we have something happening right now, and training and humanitarian support, these things are important for the long term. Uh, of course, uh, training is important in not just the long but the medium term. But what our allies need right now uh, is firepower, is, is direct support, so that we can stop the violence against the innocent. Thank you.